clock at the church building in Kosciuszko. Food pantry item is canned vegetables. The food pantry and clothes closet will be open tomorrow, beginning at 9 o'clock. Uh, there will be an estate planning seminar on Sunday, October the 20th. It will be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the Foot Street uh, Church Building. This is hosted by the Foot Street and the Boonville congregations. And if this, this is free, it, and if you would like to go, uh, please sign the list in the foyer. Uh, and it'll only add, last about an hour to an hour and a half. Golden Circle will be going to the Amish country uh, and eating at the Davy Crockett State Park this coming Friday, leaving from uh, the annex at 8.45 a.m. Uh, there'll be a sign-up sheet in the lobby tonight if you'd like to go on that trip. Should be back around 5 o'clock uh, Friday afternoon, and please wear your blue shirt. North Mississippi Ladies Retreat is October the 25th and 26th. And this will be at the Tishomingo State Park. Uh, registration forms are in the foyer. That's all of our announcements. Drew's coming to lead her singing. Invitation song will be 371. 371 will be the invitation song you want to mark at this time. Once you get that marked, you can turn over to 533. 533, we'll sing both verses. 533. <clears throat> I am the sheep and the Lord is my shepherd. Watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding over me ever. Watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter. When I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. The lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children and he is our father, watching over my soul. Thank you for the opportunity to come together, Lord. Just please be with be with Bo as he speaks to us. Lord, just please continue to be with our local government and our local leaders in the days ahead. Lord, just just be with those who have lost loved ones and those who are hurting. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'll be reading Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Good evening, everyone. Brother Jonathan Farr was supposed to do done a Devo tonight. He remembered he was going to snow down, so last minute he texts me, and I always keep something in my back pocket just in case. I, I have this article, and I want to read it to you, and I think it... It has a really good point, so I want to read it to you this evening. On July 27, 2009, the cover of Sports Illustrated featured an interesting image of Florida Gators quarterback Tim Tebow. The headline, Tim Tebow, Man on Many Missions, riffed on the, on the way he created a fan frenzy with his unique blend of faith and football. 
The championship quarterback seemed poised to jump off the glossy cover with pursed lips that oozed determination and a simple Bible verse scribbed within his black grease underneath his eyes. Philippians 4.13. Tebow's highly church southern fan base didn't need to look up this passage. No, most of them knew it by heart. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 is one of the most popular verses in any of our books that we find in the Christian Bible. Being printed of millions, millions and millions of times on keychains, on t-shirts, cell phone cases, and coffee mugs. But it's also one of the most misunderstood, misused, and misinterpreted. Like Tebow, Philippians 4.13 functioned as a kind of mystical power for many Christians. They recite the passage when they need to draw power from another place to defeat an enemy or conquer a difficult task. We need an example. You see, a, a preacher of a large megachurch in America provided the following commentary on Philippians 4.13. He said most people tend to magnify their limitations. They, fake, they focus on their shortcomings. But Scripture makes it plain. All things are possible to those who believe. That's right, it is possible to see your dreams fulfilled. It is possible to overcome that obstacle. It is possible to climb to new heights. It is possible to embrace your destiny. You may not know how it will take place. You may not have a plan, but you have all, all you have to know is that God said it, that you can, so you can. I'm not trying to use this so-called preacher as a punching bag, but rather using him as an example of the way many Christians today misunderstand and interpret this verse. For them, the all things that Christ empowers them to accomplish includes fulfilling their dreams, climbing to new heights, and embracing their destinies. Do you want a job promotion? Do you want to find your soulmate? To have a better relationship with your spouse? To make more money? No problem. You can accomplish all things through Christ who strengthens you. Unfortunately, this way of interpreting and applying Philippians 4.13 couldn't be further from its actual meaning. To understand what Paul, the author of the Philippians, actually meant we have to read the verse in its context. See, Philippians is one of those prison epistles, which is to say it was written during one of the many times Paul was in jail. So it's, it isn't surprising that the book draws heavily on the themes of humility and self-sacrifice. When you imagine Paul penning the letter in a first century prison cell, not exactly the new heights and destiny imagined above. You're all ready to begin to feel the uncomfortable and feel uncomfortable about popular opinion of this interpretation of this verse. But more than the setting, we must realize that Philippians 4.13 is part of a larger ideal. When we look at verses 11 and 12, the thought begins to take place. Starting in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, I am to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See, Paul isn't telling Christians that they should dream bigger dreams or about more money. He's reminding them that they can endure the crushing feeling of defeat if those dreams aren't realized. He's not encouraging Christians to go out and to try to conquer the world. He's reminding them that they can press on when the world conquers them. Philippians 4.13 is not really about who has the strength to, pay, to play to the best of their abilities in a sporting contest. The verse is about having strength to be content when we are facing those moments in life when physical resources may be at our minimum. Contrary to, to popular belief, the Bible does not teach that God will give you strength to do whatever you want to do. See, God is not a heavenly bellhop or divine sugar daddy or cosmic power plant to fuel your dream. Instead, the Bible teaches us, God is a sustainer when life feels unsustainable. And if you're like me, this is actually good news. Because my experience is that life is messy. Life is difficult, unpredictable, and so oftentimes full of disappointments. Most of my disappointments disappointments, I'm sure, are like yours. It's been because of decisions I've made. I don't need God who motiv motivates me to pursue 
my career dreams or chase down opportunities for personal advancement. You see, I possess those on my own. Instead, I need a God who hunkers down in life's trenches with me, who isn't afraid to get messy and wade with me through tragedy and pain and failure. See, the God of the Bible, Jesus, is better than we can even imagine because he gives us what we actually need, maybe not always what we want. God gives us the strength to survive our moments of weakness and a sense of freedom even in life's prisons. When we read Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It should still make us feel so very thankful, knowing that through Christ, we can do everything that God requires us to do. You see, we have contentment in every situation, knowing that in Christ, we have the promise of eternal life with God. That is true contentment. If you're here tonight, you've never obeyed the gospel, or maybe you've wandered away from him, please come forward when we stand and sing. And can it be that I should be dressed in a Savior's blood? Why he for me who was his pain for me Thank you. 
Good evening, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started with our prayer list. Paul Morris. Judy Nolan. Judy Nolan. I'm, I'm Renee. She's on hospice. Okay. Whitman. Greenland. Oh, my life Saturday. He's doing some better, but he's got four cracks. Did he re injure them, or was this something that didn't get fixed? Okay. Quitman Wigington. knocking and brother Greg did, did you tell me that Greg got sick yeah he was sick yesterday or earlier today food too spicy I don't know if it was too spicy or it just didn't say right June Cuffer Maggie Hester Who was that? Nina Mormon. Nina Mormon. Tennyson family. Okay, apparently Nina's feeling good today, having a good day. <coughs> Keep Nathan Pirtle. Olin Voles. The Franks family. I'd like for y'all to remember my mother, Peggy Gardner. She's going to have hip surgery in Corinth Monday morning. Anybody else? I think last week I mentioned, I know it is Sunday morning in the class and there I talked to Melanie's niece and her husband had their baby mm -hmm. last Thursday and it um, had an episode, some kind of a breathing issue and um, what else was it? What they dropped? Mm -hmm. yes. Anyway, um, they got it hooked up to monitors and stuff and it has to go five days without another episode before it can leave the hospital. And uh, he had another episode earlier this week, so the five days started over. So they're, they're still waiting for their baby to be released. Tomorrow will be a week since he's 
What's the name on that? Joshua uh, is the baby's name. It's, and it's Josh and Rianne Ware. So it's hands. Josh and Rianne Ware. Tommy Story, Rick said he had to have quadruple bypass this week. It's Linda, see so you're here. I was about to say your name. You doing good? Good. All right, if y'all will bow with me, we'll start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight, thankful that we're able to come together again tonight and study your word for a few minutes. God, tonight there's names we lift up of those that have lost loved ones that need your comfort. There's those that have been sick for a while and need your help. There's those that are hurting. There's those that have surgeries awaiting. We just pray that You watch over and guide those situations as only you can, Father. Please help us here to do our parts. Please be with our town and our community, and please forgive us of our sins and where we failed you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've got three or four parables we're going to try to cover tonight. One of them is a lengthy one, and the other ones are short. Uh, We're going to start with the... Ten bridesmaids, or ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, if you want to turn there. As these parables are winding down, I, (laughs) I hit all the easy ones first. And it seems like as as I'm preparing for these, that as we're closing this these parables out, uh, they get a little tougher as we go. I had one I was going to go with that I started this weekend, and uh, I started it there with a million. I was bouncing some stuff off of her, and I said, I just want to shift gears. I'm not ready to go there yet, so we ended up with this one. But, you know, a wise person once said, Those who fail to prepare are preparing to fail. Now, there's a lot of truth in that statement. And I think we, as Christians, forget that every single day that we're given should be a day used in preparation. And I don't mean preparation for worldly things, necessarily. I mean spiritual preparation. Should be a daily thing. I was reading earlier this week, and experts argue on this point, but here's the range. They say, the average human mind averages somewhere between 12,000 and 80,000 thoughts per day. Now, that's a huge range, I know. But the high end of that range would be 3,300 thoughts per hour. Now I know that's a whole lot of things bouncing between our ears. A lot of these thoughts are automatic, but they happen nonetheless. You think of all the advances in technology that we have. We've not come close to understanding the inner workings of the human mind. That thing's always thinking, thinking, thinking. But about what? What are you, what are we using that great gift of the human mind for? And I guess that's what I want to go into tonight. What are we thinking about, church? What are we thinking about as individuals? Putting you on the spot right now, I've had a lot of time to think about this, but I want us to honestly reflect what thoughts dominate your mind. Anybody just want to spit some answers out to start us? 
such as, like what? All right, finances. We think about worldly things like money often. We, bills come at the first of every month whether we want them to or not. They're going to be there. Family. What else? Work. Work. That's the two I jotted down immediately. Family, job. That dominates my thinking. In my day-to-day -day process, when I'm at work, thinking about my family. When I'm at home, thinking about what I need to be doing at work. I don't think I'm alone at that. What are some other things that might dominate our thoughts? All right, there you go. Sports. Would bring that up. Politics. Politics. And the flip side of that, sometimes our mind gets stuck in sin, doesn't it? Every person in here thinks a lot. And my point in that was think about this. And this leads us into what we're about to read. Do you think most Christians, and I, I think about yourself personally, do you live each day thinking and hoping Jesus will return sooner or later? How many times a day are you thinking about it? Let's read Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, Say, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. But while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in, with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, this teaching of Jesus deals with events that will occur at the return of Christ. The Jews hearing this story would have been accustomed to hearing a story in which God is portrayed as Israel's hus husband. There's several Old Testament passages where the imagery of marriage to God is utilized to characterize this relationship between God and his people. Y'all flip with me to Isaiah 54. Someone uh, find Isaiah 54 and read verses 5 through 8 for us, please. Somebody that will read loud. Fifty-four, five through 8. Yes, sir. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieving spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere <coughs> moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. All right. Thank you. 
We see it uh, used there. Now in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 32. It says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Someone flipped to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 8 through 14. Yes, sir, please. Yet I will leave some of you alive when you, when you have among the nations some who escape the sword. And when you are scattered throughout through the countries, then those of you who escape will remember, remember me among the nations where they are carried captive. How I have been broken over the, the whoring heart that has departed from me and over their eyes that are whoring after their idols. Through when? Whoa. That Ezekiel 16, 8 through 14. Oh, I, Sorry, that was six. oh I, thought, I may have said 6. 16. 16, 8 through 14. Eight through 14. Yeah. Right. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age of love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and washed over you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ear and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect to the splendor that I have bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. All right. Uh, there's other passages in Hosea. You get the point. That, that is the relationship these people were familiar with. It. We see these passages in the Old Testament, how God views his relationship with those who are his. So when Jesus told this parable to the Jews about the bridegroom, it made sense to them. And our best source for what a wedding looks like in this time period comes from the Old Testament. But we know there's a significant gap, right, in time from the Old to the New Testament. Was it 400 years around that time? Um, there's probably, I think it's likely, there were some customs that did not survive to the time period in which Jesus is talking. Just think how much wedding customs have changed in America in 30 to 50 years. But for me to understand this passage, and I'm not trying to bore you the next 5 to 10 minutes, I had to do a little background to understand it. Uh, the, inf the information I'm about to give you is from what researchers gathered from ancient sources. Uh, I tried to cut out the inessential and provide the meat only. But after getting all this information, this parable makes sense to me. So I'm going to give you all a couple of things. And uh, a lot of you probably already know this. Some of it I knew, some of it I didn't. Does anyone know it about what age a Jewish couple would typically get married in the, in the uh, first century? What age is worthy couple? They were typically quite young, and we're speaking in generalities here, right? Uh, the bride would be between 13 and 15 years old, typically. The husband between 18 and 20 years old. Why was that? Well, life expectancy wasn't that long. Uh, so they get married at a young age, and a Jewish wedding had two stages. Stage one was known, and I'll butcher this Hebrew word, uh, the kid kiddushin. This stage is equivalent to a betrothal. Here's what happens. The parents, and they possibly had the consent of the couple, made a contract of marriage. And one important thing to remember about this is this is very different than an engagement. I was trying to make it an engagement in my mind. But this 
Once this contract is signed, the woman was legally the man's wife. This contract could only be broken by divorce. Think in Matthew 1.19. When Joseph finds out about Mary, he thought about what? He, he thought about divorcing her. Even though they weren't married in the sense that we think of marriage, they were. The agreement had been made according to their customs. Uh, this, but this betrothal period lasted for about a year, and then the actual marriage occurred. And the second stage was known as the hupa, H-U-P-P-A-H. -P -P and it was not until this marriage took place that the couple actually lived together. And here's what happened. The husband got his home ready for the bride. Now picture the parable. The husband was getting his home ready for the bride. Then he would go and join his bride and her attendants at his parents' home. It is at his parents' home that the actual marriage festival took place. And when the groom arrived, everyone, everything was kind of locked down and the celebration began. But the catch was you needed to be present when the bridegroom arrived to get to celebrate in the festivities. So, you see why it's important that they have oil in their laps and be ready. That, that's why this makes sense. It didn't necessarily make sense why they wouldn't let them in. Uh, the festival usually lasted for seven days, and these were very important social gatherings. You did not want to miss out on these festivities. The people he was talking to got it. I didn't get it until I understood the background of what was going on. So that covers the background. Let's, let's answer some questions about the parable itself. Who is Jesus talking to in this parable? You have to go back to chapter 24. He's talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. The main characters are who? We have three different sets of main characters. The bridegroom is? Represents? I think the bridegroom specifically represents Christ. Jesus. The five foolish bridemaids, who would you say they represent? I just put worldly folks, possibly unprepared people. What about the five wise bridesmaids? Faithful, I put obedient Christians. But, yeah, fill in the blank. All right, now to the more meaty questions. Why were five of the bridesmaids called foolish? But specifically, they didn't what? They did not take extra oil for their lamps. Why? Didn't think they would need it. <laughs> All right. They assumed he'd be there at a certain time. They weren't expecting him at midnight. I, I, I'm assuming they were told it's going to take place at this time. They didn't see the need. Uh, I am, it drives, my, my little blonde gets it, she's ready. That kid is ready to go. Whenever it's time to go, she's ready to go. You have your own pet peeves. Mine is being late. I'm not going to be late. If I can control the situation, I will never be late if possible. I cannot stand tardiness. Those five foolish bridesmaids just assumed she wouldn't be tardy, possibly. I don't know. They expected things to go a certain way, and it didn't. And they didn't look at it as their fault. What do you think this oil symbolizes? Y'all have been saying the word over and over. Does it speak to a certain preparedness in the life of a Christian? Are we always going to get our way as Christians? Really? Does that give us a right to have a heart full of resentment? Yesterday afternoon, and it was a brief conversation, but it was a very enlightening one. I had with a talkative older gentleman, 
at the community center late yesterday afternoon. We were, we were talking about the vote. And we had just exchanged a few comments back and forth, pleasant comments. And he got real blunt, which is fine. I prefer it. He asked me, he said, uh, so are you really one of those everyday Christians? Yep. And, well, here I said, uh, well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, explain it to me so I can answer you correctly, sir. He stuck to the bluntness. This was his definition. And I, I tried to write it down immediately, but I'm pretty sure I got it right here. He said, well, a lot of folks around here go to church on Sunday, but they cuss and drink and tell lies all week. But then there are some folks, you know, who are really everyday Christians. Which one are you? <laughs> and I laughed. And he noticed he got me tickled, and I said, sir, that is just a great question. And I told him I was going to use uh, that phrase when I talk, you know, we can learn a lot about ourselves and a lot about others when we choose to shut our mouths and listen. And I'd never thought of that concept exactly that way. But he had learned through a lifetime of experience. And I had a teacher tell me one time, he, she said, we can only learn when our mouths are closed. I thought that's pretty good advice. But I knew there was wisdom in this man's observation, so I answered him as thoughtfully and carefully as I could. And here's what I told the fellow. I said, sir, I would sure like to think that I am an everyday Christian, but I know I mess up every day. But I think to answer your question, you would have to ask the folks that are around me the most and know me the best. My wife and my kids and the people I work with during the week when I'm not at church would be the people you would need to talk to to get the real answer to your question, um, whether I'm good or bad. And he said, well, I ain't never had anybody answer like that. <laughs> <laughs> and our conversation closed with I pretty much just told him, what I did for a living, and I said, now I've learned our attitude and our actions toward others answer tough questions a lot more honestly and correctly than our words, usually when we're asked. And the point I'm trying to get to is this. All ten of those bridesmaids in this parable, all ten of them were initially in the correct spot. Think about our pews. On Sunday mornings. It's the right spot. But only five. Of the bridesmaids. Got to the final correct destination. Sunday. If you were here. And you got to hear. Brother Steve Hodgins. Two lessons. You left field. Implanted with the word. Now what you did with it between Sunday night and tonight, that was up to you. See the point I'm trying to make here? Uh, if you applied what you learned and how you treated others and how you live, you're going about it the right way. The five foolish bridesmaids had the same opportunity to have the oil, but they didn't. Which I guess leads to the next question, which has an easy answer. What did the five wise bridesmaids have that the foolish did not? They had the oil. So again, what does the oil symbolize to the life of a Christian today? Preparedness. You don't know. Dedication to the Christian life. Dedication to the Christian life. To the end. The word of God living in each one of us. It directs our thoughts. It directs our actions. It leads us to be prepared to stand ready in season and out of season. The five foolish virgins at the critical hour so desperately wanted some of their friends all. 
But you see, they had to have their own. When they arrived to the party, they were late and they were not allowed to enter. Why? They had not properly prepared. Jesus tells us he knows those who are his. The Bible tells us in a couple of spots. It says, Lord, Lord, was it verse 13? Lord, Lord, open to us, but he answered, I say to you, I don't know you. If the only reason you as a grown person today is sitting in the pews on Sunday and Wednesday night is because that is what mom and daddy did or grandmom and granddaddy did, you're lost. You cannot get to heaven on someone else's oil. Paul reminded us, well, he reminded the church in Philippi in Philippians 2.12. If you're familiar with that verse. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This salvation only comes through the blood of Christ. You know, no substance on earth can take its place. And of course, we're going to talk about it a little tonight. A bunch of our friends and neighbors thought it wise to legalize the sale of a substance. That completely alters our minds and changes our behavior. That's because there are folks searching for a different, different type of oil. A temporary oil. I guess a feel-good elixir. But you know, if you flip to John, the Gospel of John with me. Jesus has already told us. In John chapter 4, when he was talking to that lady... At the well all those years ago, it's still true today. Beginning in verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me and a, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to her, Sir, you have nothing to draw with you and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father or Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst, of, thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. We've got that water. We will not seek temporary amusement in sin if our hearts and our minds are centered and grounded in God's word. Uh, this parable to, tonight reminds us of our need to be prepared at all hours and in all situations. And as we mentioned earlier tonight, and we mentioned last week, we have no idea what tomorrow might hold. We have no clue what awaits us. But I think we can all rest assured the vote yesterday opened some mission doors for the church tomorrow. Think of these following lessons Jesus gave us from this short parable. Uh, and our time's about gone. Number one, God's day of judgment may not come as quickly as some of his disciples anticipate. He was telling them this then and he was telling them this now. Think of the long list of mispredictions. Jesus tells us clearly we will not know the day or the hour. Why any Christian would get caught up trying to guess it is beyond me. The five foolish virgins did not bring oil because they did not think they'd have to wait long. God expects us to prepare for the long game. Living a Christian life is a marathon. It's not a hundred meter sprint. Second thing, wise Christians... Must be ready to show God their good deeds at all times. We must, at a moment's notice, have our lamp ready to shine. 
And the third thing is those who are unprepared for Jesus' coming will not enter the final kingdom. This is made clear. And then I think there's a subtle warning. Uh, one thing we all have to be concerned about, all of us, is running out of oil. And when I say all, that, that means every one of us in here. Have any of y'all ever known a Christian who was on fire but they don't see it through to the end. That's a problem, right? What can we do to help? I know we've been trying hard lately on that, but we, I mean, you in the pew, what can we, sitting to the people next to us, they were here three weeks ago, we haven't seen them since, <coughs> have we reached out? What happens? Why does it happen? We, we acknowledge it does happen. Why does it happen? Everybody's going quiet on me now. There's lots of reasons. Uh, well, let me just go over this list with you. Um, there is uh, people get burned out. Sometimes they get their feelings hurt. Sometimes they don't feel appreciated. Uh, so they let resentment build. Uh, I found this. I gave this to my team three or four years ago after a couple of tough losses. Uh, so wrapping up this parable, we, we began asking about what do you think about? We know according to stats, we think a lot. What, uh, our thoughts should be centered on Christ, and if our thoughts are centered on Christ, there should be a joy that everyone sees. And something that should never be or seen is a miserable Christian. But some people uh, who worship sometimes appear to carry sour expressions and miss this joy. Christians have the greatest gift there ever was. So try to avoid this list. This is a list of 25 things or 25 ways to make yourself miserable. If you're doing any of these things, stop, change, do something else. Uh, 25 things that make yourself miserable. Number one, think about yourself often. Number two, talk about yourself often. Number three, and remember this is ways to make yourself miserable. Listen greedily to what people say about you. Number four, expect to be appreciated. Number five, be sensitive to slights. Number six, never forgive any criticism. Number seven, trust nobody but yourself. Number eight, this one's a tough one. Demand agreement with your own views on everything. Number nine, pout if people are not grateful to you for favors shown them. Number 10, be on the lookout for a good time for yourself. Number 11, shirk your duties if possible. Number 12, do as little as possible for others. Number 13, let anger and resentment build up inside of you. Number 14, seek only pleasure. Number 15, do whatever is convenient. Number 16, don't do your best. Number 17, don't do what you know is right. Number 18, don't take time to rest and relax to enjoy life. Number 19, take everything seriously. Number 20, be cheap with your money. Number 21, don't ask God for help. Number 22, try to do everything yourself. Number 23, live in the past. Number 24, live in the future. Number 25, try to control the uncontrollable. I think we would all do good to avoid doing those things. We have to remember this is important. We, we cannot hide. There is nothing the devil or his people love more than to see one of God's children fall. We cannot be ashamed of Christ. We have to follow 
his example. Uh, I guess we will stop there. And uh, four other parables I was planning on going over tonight <laughs> is what we will... I told you I didn't have enough stuff for tonight. I mean, we'll begin there uh, next week. Will you all bow with me? We'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much tonight for the church you've planted here at Boonville and the folks that fill up these pews. God, please be with us and help us be lights in this community. Help us lead people to you. Help us do everything we can to be the children you called us to be. Please be with us the rest of this week. Forgive us where we failed you and bring us back here safely the next time. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.